This is ROW. Welcome to Rant of Whatever. I'm your host, Kevin Yarrow, and on today's episode, we bring you show number two in our month long spooky series. Today, I have on a special guest named Kellen Fluckiger. He's a life coach, musician, and author of eight books Down from the Gallows, Meditation, The Amazing Journey, Volume 1, Meeting God at the Door, The Book of Context, The Results of Equation, The Story Arc, Tight Rope of Depression, and Walking Without Fear. You can purchase his books on Amazon and visit kellingfluckiger.com where you can find links to his books and many more things. That's K E L L A N F L U C K I G E R.com. Now let's flip over to Kellen's story of his near death experience because it was rather amazing. All right, well, in 2018, I, I have been um, a person who has known all my life that there is something beyond us. Like we can all, nearly everyone I talk to, knows and can feel that there is something greater than us. Uh, You may be afraid of it. You may believe in it. You may call it a name by a certain church or religion. You may not. You may consider it, you know, nature or earth or the universe or something. But we all feel that there's powers that are outside our ability to understand right now. So I've always felt that. Sometimes I've ignored it. Sometimes I have cursed it. Uh, I, I've been affected by it a number of times, uh, and sometimes really dramatically. So the story I'll tell you about my near-death experience isn't the first time I have been dramatically impacted. It is the first and only time that I've had the kind of experience I'm going to describe. But 10 years before that, in 2000, the end of 2007, in August, I had a powerful what I would consider divine intervention that changed the course of my life. I walked away from a 30 year career. I was an executive making ridiculous amounts of money, but I was also suffering from depression and the in and out of rehab and had addiction problems and so forth. So I had an event then that took place. Like you see those reality TV shows intervention, not like that at all. This was God staging an intervention. And some things happened and just completely changed the direction of my life. So I was very acquainted with the feeling of other dimensional reality intervention, like it feels different than anything that goes on in your life. Anyway, so at that, after that time, I completely changed careers. I'd had 30 years in energy, electricity, and working in energy in the United States and in Canada, and had been a prominent figure on the world stage. I'd spoken at universities and conferences around the world on market design and other things that are probably about as interesting as watching paint dry. But anyway, um, after that, I, I dedicated my life to coaching, to helping people, what I call discover, develop, and manifest their divine gifts. And so that's really the direction I started after that sudden change in life. I'm quitting one job I'd had for 30 years and just doing something new. So I went along in that direction for 10 years. And uh, at the same time as that divine intervention, another one brought my wife to me, who we are now married to. We've been together 14 and a half years. That's a whole story by itself, because before that, because of my depression and stuff, I'd had uh, multiple failed relationships and a disaster. But the Divine intervention included a complete change of a lot of things. So anyway, that was going on well. And and after we were together 10 years, Joy and I decided to go on a cruise. We hadn't ever been on a cruise before, just, I don't know, we just hadn't. So we went to the Baltic Sea, which is over in, uh, I didn't know the Baltic Sea runs east and west, but we did. And we visited cities like Helsinki and Oslo and St. Petersburg and Tallinn, Estonia, and, you know, all the ports that are around that sea. At the end, uh, we were in Oslo, and at the first of our two days in Oslo, I I started to feel really sick. And I thought, at first, it was heat exhaustion. They were having a really hot, hot uh, time, the hottest one in 100 years or something, and I was dragging around backpacks and heavy stuff, and we were walking a lot. The second day, it got really bad, and I was just having to rest all the time. And then we were flying home anyway because the cruise was over. And so we flew home on Tuesday. First sick day was Monday. Flew home on Tuesday. 
all the rest of that week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it kept getting worse. And I just kept thinking if I stayed in bed. So my wife canceled all my coaching calls and I just stayed in bed for a week. By Friday afternoon, it was clear that this was not okay and it was pretty serious. So I went to the, one of the walk-in clinics, which we have here in Canada, and um, it wouldn't let me in. Uh, the people running it took one look and said, we can't help you go directly to the emergency room. So I went to the University of Alberta Medical Center and in typical emergency room fashion, you know, there's always a lot of people there and uh, usually it's an hour or two or sometimes longer to get uh, first triaged and then put inside to, to a room and eventually, you know, the busy staff will come and look at you and do whatever they're going to do. Within 10 minutes of walking in the room, I had been noticed and picked up and put in a private room, which I, I didn't actually even know they had in emergency rooms. I thought they were all those little curtain things. But anyway, I was in a private room with the door. The doctors paid immediate attention, came in and started asking me all kinds of questions, where I'd been, what I felt like, what had happened, how long had been going on. And I told them everything, repeated the same story that I just told you only in a lot more detail, exactly what I felt like and everything else. And they told me, uh, well, they were definitely going to admit me to the hospital right now, serious, and they needed to find a bed. And then they came back in a couple of hours and said, okay, we found a place. At a minimum, you have severe pneumonia in both lungs, but something else is going on and we don't know what it is. And then they came back in an hour or so and said, okay, we found a place, but we're actually probably going to have to put you in intensive care because this is really bad. And and then a couple of hours later, they came back. Finally, they took me upstairs to the room, still saying, we're going to put you in ICU. And then the doctor came and said to me something that you never want to hear. He said, uh, do we have permission to intubate you and do anything we need to do to preserve your life? And so it was a horrifying question. And I thought, uh, OK, sure. By then, like this had been hours now, I'd sent Joy home. We had two anim four animals, two dogs, two cats. And she needed to, you know, let them out, feed them and do that kind of stuff. And I told her, you know, I'll be here. Just go home, go to bed and come back tomorrow. After the doctor asked me that question, <clears throat> I went into meditation. I'm a long, long, long time practitioner of meditation, like decades, 40 years. In fact, the first five of my 13 books that I have now I wrote were about meditation. But anyway, I went into meditation and I felt something I'd never felt before. I could feel my spirit and my body separating. And I'd never felt anything like that. And I could feel things coming apart. And so I sent Joy a text and I was getting so weak I could hardly use the phone. But I sent her three lines. First line said, I see you. Second line said, isolation slash intubation which means they stuff you full of tubes. And they also told me they were going to put me in biological isolation, which is one of those separate rooms with double doors and airlocks and all that crap because they didn't know what I had. And they were treating me like I had something from Mars. So isolation and intubation. And the third line was I may be dying. She was asleep and didn't get that message. But in about 2.30 in the morning, she got a call from the hospital. Also the call you never want to get. And the nurse said to her, are you coming? And she said, what? And then she saw my text. So that was how this started. And in very short order, I went into the crash cart, code green, blue, red, orange, black, whatever it is in that hospital, I don't know. So I was immediately uh, unconscious. I went into a coma. They put me in the emergency room in all the isolation and everything else. And then after some period of time, my heart stopped and I died. During then, uh, so two things went on. I had an experience during that time and what went on outside, I don't know, I wasn't there. Uh, I was somewhere else. But when I came to from my, in the spiritual side, I was in a gray room. I was horizontal, like I was on the bed. I could see over to my left and behind me a little, a doorway. And I wanted to be at that door. I don't know why, but I just had the feeling I wanted to be at that door. Now, I couldn't see how big the room was, and I couldn't really see the floor or the ceiling. Everything was just sort of a nondescript gray. Uh, and then I was standing at the door, and I was leaning on the door jamb on my right shoulder. 
and I looked across and I could see someone leaning on the door jamb on that side. Now that side of the door was white. My side was gray. It wasn't like streaming through the door or anything. It was just white on that side and gray on my side. And then uh, the individual that was looking at me on the other side looked right at me and said one question. I said, do you want to come home? And so in a flash, I knew who I was talking to, where I was, what was going on, what the question meant and everything. Because when you're in that kind of place and state, you just know what's going on. There's not a sign, you know, it, you just know stuff. So there I was and the question hit me like a ton of bricks, not in a frightened way. One of the most notable and interesting things about the interviews was the absence, the absolute absence of fear or negative feeling in any way. It was um, the question hung in the air. I knew without question it needed an answer. There was no expectation about the answer. Everything was quiet and gentle in that way. So we talked for a little while and I thought about joy and the circumstance. I thought about the mission I was on with my coaching, helping people discover who they were and really as divine children of, of the divine and their gifts and talents. And so finally I said, well, I'm not done yet. I'm not, I'm not finished. Okay. And that was the end of that conversation. And the next day, and I'm assuming, this is an assumption on my part, I'm assuming that after that decision was made, they were able to restart my heart because they did. Uh, and the next day, I was back at the door um, in conversation. And I don't know how I knew it was the next day or anything else. You just know stuff. So I'm the next day, I'm there at the door with the same person, same conversation. And the, the subject of the previous day, which is, do you want to come home? Didn't come up. It was decided. So then the conversation was about what are you going to do? So I talked about the mission that I was already on about helping people realize who they really were and to, to, to maximize the gifts that they have. And the way I describe it is living the ultimate life. And I define that as living a life of purpose, prosperity and joy that we create by serving with our divine gifts. And that's just a definition that I use, but I was, I'm about that. And I talked about that and everything else. And four things became really, really clear to me during that interview, the second conversation. And these are the four things. Number one, that every single one of us without question and without exception are divine beings. We are created, but with divine intent, by, if you want to call it God, by God, with a purpose. Number two is we all were given gifts and talents. Everybody's are different, but we were given those gifts and talents. Number three uh, was that each of us has purpose and mission that we knew about before we came here. We agreed to, and we were excited about. In other words, we were excited about the opportunity. We knew what our gifts were, and we, we were excited about it and committed to do those things before we came. The fourth thing was that all the help that we need to develop our gifts and talents and to fulfill our divine purposes, all the help we need is available from both sides of that door. And so, and it was a much longer conversation. I'm summarizing this. Part of it felt like, I don't know if you've seen that Jodie Foster movie, contact yes. where the aliens contact the earth and there's some spaceship they build and it falls down through a field of some kind. And then she has this incredible experience. Part of it felt like that. I felt like if I hadn't been in some kind of a protective bubble, I would have been incinerated with the level of information and stuff that was coming into me. And I was somehow protected and able to assimilate and participate in that at that time. But anyway, so the conversation was quite long. And in after realizing those four things that were divine, have gifts and talents, have mission and purpose, and that all the help we need is available, I ask, I felt incredible. I asked my I asked her incredulous also question. I said, Well, since that's true, why do we settle for crumbs? Like what okay, that's true. I mean, you don't 
question it. I didn't say if that's true. I said since that's true, because like, who am I talking to and where is this? Okay, why do we settle for crumbs? And I don't know if in the economy of heaven, brevity is a virtue, but the answer was four words. Because you don't believe. And it, it was, you know, okay. Of course, like what else could the answer be? So then that meant believe, believing that these things are possible and true is, is not just a factor, but the pivotal key factor. And so then I went on and I said, okay, so what, I, I see that, and I see that in my own coaching practices. I work with people. It's not usually that people don't know what to do to grow their lives, to grow their business, to grow, they don't, it's not usually they don't know what to do. It's that they don't do what they know. They're afraid. They know what they could do, but they won't. They think it'll fail. They don't think they're good enough. I mean, the list of excuses is forever. So I said, okay, what can I do about that, about this not believing thing? And the answer there was funny too. It, well, glad you ask. So then what came next, it was a whole framework that I use today in my coaching practice, which I wrote not in that book, Meeting God at the Door, but a sequel, which is called The Book of Context, which talks about the framework of belief that we all have based on our beliefs and experiences and expectations and stuff that's happened to us before. And that all forms what I call our context, which is what we believe is possible about how we fit in the world. And the funny thing about the context, it's not true. It's just our set of expectations about how things work, right? Like we didn't sail when we thought the earth was flat. And that's a silly example, but we do the same thing with what we think is possible now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that was a long conversation and all of that. And when that was finished, I was pretty excited. I had this whole book of context framework about changing beliefs. I had these other four principles and I was buzzing and pretty excited. The third and last conversation was the next day and we're back at the door, same framework, same setup. And this conversation was again, only one question. And I came back buzzing. I was excited. I'd been rehearsing all this stuff over and over in my mind, saying things so I wouldn't forget anything. And and uh, there we are back and uh, he looked at me and he said, <clears throat> are you sure? And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I thought, oh, for crying out loud, what do you mean, am I sure? Am I stupid? Am I missing something? Am I biting off more than I can chew? Like what, am I sure? And, and so we talked about it from all those points of view, everything I could go over, am I biting off more than I could chew? Have I missed something? Am I stupid? Like what? And when we got all done, I finally said, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And then that conversation ended uh, with it, nothing was said, but it ended with a finality that I knew we were done. And so that was the end of the, the interviews. Sometime later, I was in a coma for nearly three weeks. Uh, sometime, you know, several, many, many days later, I came out of the coma. The first thing I did when I came out of the coma was I was bubbling, mumbling all of the stuff that I'm telling you and mostly the book of context and the context principles and everything else. And I thought for sure that everybody was going to think I was crazy because I was just, I'm sure I was babbling, you know, just having come out of a coma. Probably I expected it. It was incoherent, but it turns out that it wasn't so because some days later when I was moved from the intensive care up to the regular part of the hospital, they came to quote, bid me farewell. And the infectious disease specialist that had been in charge, he said to me, you know, bye, you know, I'm gonna, I hope I never see you again, and joking. And I said, dude, I hope I never see you again. And, uh, you know, funny. And there we went. And then when he got done, he, he looked and he said, but seriously, uh, when you get better and you get out of here, I need you to come back and tell me what you saw. So he, they were all affected and something interesting happened. I just, 
I went on and then I, that was in July. I got out of the hospital by October. I had written these two books and I went on a speaking tour, spoke in four places in October. When I got out of the hospital, I was so weak, I couldn't walk. By October, I'd gotten enough strength to move around and walk okay. I'd lost 35 pounds in the hospital, so I looked pretty bad to start with, pretty uh, like somebody from a concentration camp or something. But anyway, um, in December, if this wasn't enough, in December, as a follow-up and to this very experience, I woke up on the morning of December 5th, which was four months later, or five months after July, I got out of the hospital, and I was paralyzed from the waist down. So I got up and got out of bed and fell on my face. And then I tried to get on my hands and knees and fell on my face. And finally, my wife called 911 and we got to the hospital. And it turned out that the infection that I had had, and I didn't tell you what that was, they found out on Monday after I went in Friday that what I had was a necrotizing MRSA, MRSA, which is lethal by itself in both lungs and in my bloodstream. And they told me that the, uh, here in this COVID world, we talk about a mortality rate of two to 3% of people that get COVID die. They told me that the 10 day kill rate of what I had was 100%. So the fact that I died, I didn't get to the hospital till the end of day five. <laughs> they didn't know what I had until the end of day eight. Somewhere in the middle there I expired, which is not a surprise because it was rampant everywhere in my body, bloodstream and everything. <clears throat> so anyway, um, it had come back in December into inside my spinal column and had created an abscess about four inches long that had hardened and was putting pressure on my spinal cord, which paralyzed me from the waist down. So they did some MRIs and uh, they took a look at it and moved me immediately from the emergency room to the operating room. So I didn't even get admitted ER to OR the on-call spinal surgeon came and did midnight surgery. It was like the middle of the night. And, um, the, and I got out of the hospital in 10 days and I could walk again. I, my walking was restored and two things happened. Why well, I'm adding this to this experience that happened five months before. Number one, when he took my stitches out on the 27th of December, he looked at me and he said, I could count on less than one hand the number of people that have come into the hospital like you and have walked out under their own power in 10 days. The second thing that happened is they put in a PICC line, which is an intravenous antibiotic thing. They put it under your right arm and it goes through veins all the way inside of you and drips into your heart on the left side. They do that because the antibiotics they're giving you are so powerful they would collapse your veins if they put them in anywhere else. So they have to put it so that it drips right into your heart where the biggest blood flow is. So they, I wore one of those for six weeks and the incident that happened that I know was related to what happened in the summer was when I went to pick up the bags, like you had to wear, I had to wear a pump and you know, they had those bags that you carry for six weeks and they would pump the antibiotic in me all day long. And then I'd switch bags and so forth. When I went to the outpatient to pick up the antibiotics, these high powered things, I, I went in there and it was across the street in a different outpatient pharmacy. And I said to him, to the nurse that happened to be there dispensing, I said, I'm here to pick up my antibiotics. I'm uh, Kellen. And I didn't even get through saying my name. She looked at me, she said, oh, we know who you are. And I said, what? She said, oh yeah. We know who you are. And I thought, so the things that I had said not only were remembered, but this is six months later or five months later, and they knew what had gone on. So it was very, very, very related to that initial incident. And the power of those, of the description that I gave was such that it six months later was 
not only remembered, but was forefront in those people's minds. In other words, this person that had that experience is back and they knew who I was and this wasn't even in the same building and the same anything. And she was as serious as a heart attack. Oh yeah, we know who you are. And I thought, holy crap. So that's the sum and substance of it. The actual details are written in those two books, Meeting God at the Door and the Book of Context, which are available on Amazon if anybody's interested in getting all the details. So I'm prepared for any kind of questions that you have. Uh, <laughs> that was an incredible, that's incredible. Uh, the, so the, um, when you were at that door, when you crossed over, there was like a, a, a being there, did you, something that told you to go back? I didn't cross the door. I was standing, I would been was across the room, laying horizontal like I was, and then I saw a doorway, and I wanted to be at the doorway. So I was at the doorway, and I was just like leaning on the door jam on the gray side. And there was someone on the other side leaning on that door jam. I never crossed the threshold. The invitation was, do you want to come home? meaning come here. And I knew that would be moving on to the next place. And I knew all of those things. So the coming back was simply a decision not to go. Mm -hmm. I was um, there. The question was, do you want to come home? So this, so this person, this being that was leaning against the door, did you, were you able to see it clearly or it was all just blurry, wasn't it? It was not blurry at all. No. It was an individual. It looked just like a person. Um, it was, everything was white, so it was very bright. And I wasn't really focused on trying to get features. So, yeah. you know, somebody asked me, oh, is it some, you know, gray beard dude? And I thought, you know, I wasn't really paying attention to that sort of thing. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, what color are the eyes and what did it look like? And somebody said, well, you know, was it a man or a woman? And you know, I don't know. I, I believe the recollection was that it was a man, but I wouldn't say anything like that wasn't important. It was the glorified creator there. And I was speaking to that personage. It was clearly in the form of a person. It wasn't a blob. It wasn't an elephant or anything. It was a person with the shape of a person there in conversation with one of his divine creations. Wow. Incredible. Uh, that's incredible. <laughs> Do the doctors ever know what you got sick with? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's called methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. It's called, it's a uh, MRSA, M-R-S-A. Oh, and it's wow. A, it's a, it's an antibiotic. It's a super bug. It's one of the things they call super bugs. It's a highly antibiotic resistant bug that is lethal. It kills many people. The, the kill rate of it, like I said, is astronomical. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to get. So a lot of the questions they asked me to start with is where have I been that I might have gotten this bug? Well, I'd been to a number of Eastern European cities. Uh, you know, it's hard to get in the body. Uh, all kinds of stuff, but when it gets in there, it's it's as lethal as they get. Mm -hmm. They said the 10 day kill rate, like I said, was 100%. So we don't know where I got it. I was on a cruise ship in several ports of call. And uh -huh. so I don't know, you know, your body, it has to get in some way, some kind of cut or scratch or something. It can't go through the skin. And you might have, I might have aspirated the bacteria in. But anyway, yeah, it's a high-powered lethal bacteria. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, that could come from anywhere with the way that we're using antibiotic stuff nowadays. It's crazy. We've always been warned about those superbugs. That's proof that they're around, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was It was a superbug. I mean, they administered what is called the antibiotic of last resort. That's what I was on. Wow. They, I didn't know they even had that. And the antibiotic of last resort. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, thank you very much for sharing. That's a absolutely insane story. I, 
it, it, it's always incredible to me to hear near-death experiences like that. And people have seen anything from the other side at all and being able to report back on it. It's always interested me so hardcore. To... Well, the, the thing that's most, uh, all my life, I had always been, I was raised in a, what I would call a bit of a fanatic religious en environment. And that brought in a lot of discipline that today would be felony child abuse. Huh. I would have been removed from the home and stuff like that. So I had always had carried around this sense of not being good enough. You know, I'm, I really suck. No matter what I do, I can't this and that and the other. And what I noticed most notably and wrote about some in the book, too, is the the entire set of interviews were conducted in the absence of any of that feeling. It was profoundly quiet. It was profoundly loving. It was soft. It was inviting. It would be easy for me to understand how people who are presented with a similar choice or the opportunity to make a choice would easily opt to to go on. It was inviting. It wasn't fearful in the slightest um, or any of that. And I didn't feel like, oh, I haven't done right yet. I got to go fix some. None of that. It was simply, I'm not done yet. I, mm -hmm. I, there's more I want to do. And so the choice was to come home, which would have been to step across or to stay here, which was to continue to do the things that I wanted, augmented by the things that I then learned in the second long conversation. Absolutely incredible. Wow. And it was peaceful, <laughs> it was quiet, and it was beautiful. And it was interesting because <clears throat> when you're in a coma and they have all this stuff in you, it's not uncommon for all kinds of other things to happen. And during the other days in the hospital, I had what I would call delusions, paranoid things. I saw things growing out of walls. I saw all kinds of hallucinations that are pretty typical. And the doctors and nurses said, yeah, that's typical. And I told Joy that I'd made a deal with somebody to spray mist in the air that had helped providing properties and that she owed him a PayPal receipt and, you know, these elaborate things. The difference was all of those were if I had to describe the color black and fearful and fear inducing and panicky and I was hearing conspiracies and my I don't hear very well. I, I have some hearing aids that I wear sometimes and my hearing seemed to be sharpened and I hear heard, heard all kinds of but they were all painful and frightening and this experience was completely separate apart and different. It was lucid. It wasn't fuzzy. All that other stuff was like you described vague and fuzzy and frightening and black and the hallucination part. And I talk about that in the book too. It's so different, quiet, peaceful, inviting, clean, open. And the power of the, the power, like truth, carries its own power. So when you're talking or I'm talking to someone, it's not difficult to tell when things that are not true are being said. We all have sort of an internal BS meter and it just feels wrong. It was none of that. Everything felt exactly as it was. Well, that was Kellen Fluckiger with his amazing near-death experience. Um, he's a life coach, musician, and author of eight books. You can find those books on Amazon or go to his website, kellenfluckiger.com, K-E-L-L-A-N-F-L-U-C-K-I-G-E-R.com. And that's it for today's show, and until next time, stay spooky scary.